Chainmail makes such a beautiful pattern, doesn't it? It's actually easier to make than you might think it is. Especially this is the uh, this being the simple European four in one pattern. This is a I'll call it a large project that I'm working on long term, just uh, very slowly here and there when I get time. As a just a, I'm going to make a large sheet of this stuff. Um, I actually have I'll get this out of the way. Twelve, twelve thousand rings that I have to do. So I'm gonna be working at this for a while. Uh, the tools you need are a pliers, a pliers, and a pliers. That's it. Uh, technically, you only need two, but I've found that having two small players and one bigger players is the best way to go. Uh, specifically, you want the parallel jaw players. So a normal set of players, if you just give me one moment. I'll just use this needle nose here. So as you probably know, a normal player is when the angle of the handle changes, the angle of the jaw changes proportionally. Uh, that works with chain mail. You can use um, a more appropriately sized standard players, but the rings start to move around a lot and it's more cumbersome. These parallel players get a really nice grip on the rings and they don't move around at all where with an angled players it's only going to contact it at really the only that one point on the edge it'll only contact it on this edge instead of on the whole face so that gives you the best grip possible the reason why i recommend having two different size players is because the smaller ones are for twisting the rings together when it's in the sheet. But this makes it a lot easier when you open and close rings um, to get your ring set up to be then put on the sheet that you want. So I'll go through that process very quickly. So I've got some rings as they come from the manufacturer here. As you can see, these are split rings. So half of these you will have to open and half of these you will have to close. These are, this is my closed pile. This is my open pile. Um, I'll get more into why you need to do that later, but just first understand these need to be closed. These need to be opened. So I'll zoom in here and try and stay in frame. So the way that I will usually do this is to grab with this player and grab it backhanded and then set it down into the jaw of the lower players and then twist it back and forth until it lines up perfectly. Now you can see here that they, that this ring is not meeting, it's, the tips are not touching, and that is not good because you can get snags on this. So the way you can avoid that is first by, well before you even start to close up the ring, is put it with put it in the jaws of your players if you have this style if you have a different style you'll need a you know unappropriately sized players and close up the ring so that the two ends are past each other then when you put it into the players and then you twist it back and forth you hear it did you hear it pop there now when you look at this the two ends are touching. 
but you can see that this end is lower than this end. So they're touching, but they're like this. You can correct that by putting the high, by putting it in the jaw of your smaller players like this. So that the high side is touching the top jaw and the low side is touching the bottom jaw and just squeeze it ever so slightly. And that will give you a very nice squared up ring. Some of these will still have a, a burr on the inside. You can fix that pretty easily by just putting that burr in the corner of the jaw of your players and just squeezing it really tight and that will crush it enough that it won't be bothering um, anything once it's on the sheet of mail. So that is how you close the rings. Opening rings is a lot easier. All you have to do is twist it open. There you go. Um, so the trick with opening the rings is the more you open them, the easier it will be to feed this through the other rings. But if you open it too far, now you're going to have to close it back even further. And while working with steel and stainless steel, it's not too bad to open it up really far and then close it. If you're working with aluminum rings, which a lot of people do because of cost and they're just a lot easier to manipulate, those will work hard and so quickly that you can actually snap them if you move them back and forth too far or too, fa or, um, too often. Or I should say too many times. So um, I'm going to close all of these and open all of these. And while I'm doing that, I will... Talk a little bit more about these players and maybe even give a few fun facts about chainmail. So these, the smaller players, you can get from pretty much any online retailer. These ones, I believe, came from Amazon. They're about 20 bucks or $25. It, it really depends on, um, you know, the phase of the moon, day of the week, all that sort of stuff. But they're in the $20 range, so they're, they're actually quite reasonable. Um, and they come in many different varieties beyond just this flat jaw style. Your players are consumables, so they will not last forever. The more projects you do, the more you work with steel and stainless steel, the more often you'll have to replace your players. And again, at, at 20 bucks, they're... They aren't too bad. You can get cheap $7 players that are not parallel jaw. And um, those ones work just fine, especially on aluminum with the smaller rings, because these are probably too big for doing the, the quarter inch size rings. Another consideration is that these handles are metal they are not rubberized some people prefer the the sticky or the uh, the soft grip of the rubber i prefer the bare metal handle um a friend of mine who actually taught me how to do this um, i'll put a link to his channel in the, in the description because he actually has a a few videos um of his projects that are way beyond the skill level that i have and way beyond the uh the patience that i have he actually bought these same players and dipped the handles, and I think he had some pretty good results with them. Um, these players, as you can see, have one spring. They actually come with a spring on both sides, but I found that it was too difficult over long periods of um, doing rings that it just made my, my hand cramp up a little bit too much. So reducing it to just the one spring, although it doesn't return to its full open quite as well, um, you really only need to op be opening and closing these just a little bit. This player's is going to be a lot harder to find. You can find them used on eBay. I've seen them listed there anywhere from $12 to $40, depending on condition. This is a really, really old player's. This is made by the American Player Wrench Corporation in Chicago, Illinois. It's The price is stamped on it at $7.00 if that tells you how old this thing is. 
the neat thing about this players is that if you extend the handle backwards, if you hyperextend the handles, the jaw will come out and it's geared. This is a, a geared player wrench. And there's a lot of different uh, player inserts that you can use in this, which is part of what makes this thing so useful for a lot of different things. Um, it especially is, is good for this because it, it sits flat, unlike these, which will rock around a little bit and um, work on both handles. This one only works on one handle. So this is almost like a vise. And, you know, this is my manipulation tool. And I don't even have to use my hand to open this. Just twisting the... Using this hand to twist the ring out of the players does all the work. So... Uh, these rings I got from a website called the, oh man, I already forgot the name. I'll put the, the name in somewhere right here. Um, or maybe the name will come to me here in a minute. The Ring Lord, there we go. The Ring Lord. Uh, it seems like it's a smaller outfit that, uh, that does the rings. However, they are very reasonably priced. And if you buy, you know, in larger quantities, you can get a fairly significant discount. They've got aluminum, anodized aluminum, and all sorts of different colors. Um, they have this stainless steel, which I really like. They have um, black oxide stainless steel. They have um, carbon steel. And the fancy stuff, if you really want to pay the big bucks, if you remember, these have a focus. Come on. Uh, these have, oh geez, man, that focus is really bad. Move up more slowly. Well, anyway, these rings have a bit of a burr. Their more expensive rings are actually ground down to be perfectly f flat and flush so that you don't have any of those burrs hanging out. I don't really feel like paying the sort of money that those cost, but if uh, if you really want the nicest look and feel on your rings, definitely buy those. Um, they, they only restock, um, you know, ever so often. They aren't, um, they aren't always in stock on all the sizes of rings. So these ones, I think I, I had to wait for this this size of ring. Let's see. I'll, I'll go through some uh, fun facts of chainmail. So, uh, chainmail is from the Middle Ages. It was uh, well, the, it was phased out in the 14th century because um, black powder muskets and you know, more powerful weaponry was coming into fashion. And because of that, chainmail just wasn't going to, it wasn't going to cut it anymore in terms of armor and defense. So um, plate armor became more prevalent um, in the 14th century. But while chainmail was in use, it had some really important advantages Oh, you know what? I'm supposed to be closing these now. Yeah, pay attention, Casey. It had some really uh, important advantages. One is that it's extremely flexible. And that is important in battle when you have to move around a lot. And, you know, if you are hindered in your movement, your enemy will quickly take advantage of that. And you won't be alive for very long. Another advantage is that it is easy to make, and I can attest to that because this this European 4-in-1 pattern that I'll show you uh, takes about 15 minutes to learn. Once you have the pattern down, it's you just keep rocking on. Uh, it is very easy to repair, and it's fast to repair. 
that is really the beauty of, to me, that's the beauty of chain mail is that if you, if you make a mistake or if something gets torn or ripped in a certain section, it, it's, this is almost like, like sewing with metal. You just, um, open up all the rings in a straight line and it just kind of unzips. You do your repair or you take out a square and then you just put in a new square. It is, uh, it's just so neat how easily you can, how easily and, um, quickly you can repair chain mail. Here I go closing them again. Embarrassing. So it, uh, on the lines of it being easy and fast to repair and easy to make, it is easily adaptable to, the, to any size of, of soldier. If you have a small guy or a big guy, all you have to do is take out a few rows or add in a few rows to make it longer or wider. So use that same technique of just kind of unzipping it in one section. You just, you know, quick add a patch in and there you go, it's resized for a different person. Chainmail, um, it is, it does have some weaknesses. Um, it isn't, it isn't really that strong compared to other armor types because like, uh, let's say for arrows, arrows are going to go, if I, arrows are going to go straight through that. No problem. It's not meant for that. It's meant for, um, preventing slashes and, um, and, and slice type attacks. Uh, because it um, distributes that pressure, that load of a sword or something similar from um, going through. It's still going to hurt, don't get me wrong, but uh, you won't get sliced in half wearing chain mail. So I got these opened, I got these closed, and wouldn't you know it, but here are some that I prepared earlier. Lovely how that works. So I'll just add these into my other batches. Alright, something that is very important when doing chain mail is getting a pattern down. Because it is such a repetitive, it's a repetitive sort of work, um, if you don't get a solid process down to to put this together, it, you'll become super inefficient, it'll go really slow, you'll get frustrated, and then you're never going to do it again. So just understand, after you get a little bit of practice, you can understand what's easiest for you. And for me, I can already tell that I want to flip this, this sheet around because um, the way that you feed the ring through would be if you follow this pattern, I'd have to go down like this. And I personally don't like doing that. I prefer to go up and through. So, where am I? There we go. Nope, it's still backwards. There we go. So now this pattern is going the other direction, which means all I have to do is go up like that. See how easy that is to hook the two rings? Um, I'll quick grab a piece of paper here to kind of explain a couple of the properties of this. So this is called European 4-in-1 because for every given ring, there are four rings that connect to it. I mean, that's pretty obvious. The other thing you should note is the direction of the pattern. If I pull this apart and you look edge on, it makes a diagonal pattern. 
also in one row, like let's just say this first row here, you notice they will all go down. And if you go to that second row in, they will always go up to connect like that. More symmetrical, but that's what you get. So every, every row or every other row is going to behave exactly the same. So this first row and this third row are exactly the same. The second row and this fourth row are exactly the same. The evens are going this way. The odds are going this way. If you have OCD, this will both be a treat for you and it will be a nightmare because when things don't work out quite right, you're going to get really annoyed. But when things look right and feel right, they're, uh, they're pretty good. So the way you want to start is by grabbing one open ring and two closed rings. This open ring is going to be the equivalent of this second row, so it's going to have to go diagonally this way. These two closed rings are going to be the same as this first row, so they're going to be going in this way. Feed the two feed the two closed rings over the open ring. Then take your first two links on the first row and feed the close the open ring through those two closed rings. And then close this one. You'll want to follow the same sort of process of closing this ring as you did with closing the rings ahead of time. You want the alignment of the ring ends to be as flush as possible, otherwise it's going to catch. So if you were to turn this sheet into a shirt and um, you didn't have all these rings closed up correctly, it's going to snag on your undershirt. And that's just not going to be that fun. So... Now, that's the only time that you'll use that closed ring through two of the upper rings like that. Now, you'll grab an open ring and two closed rings. You'll go through the, the first open ring of your new row and the two closed rings of, the, of the, that first row. So you'll be going through three, three rings at once. Pull that up and then close it. One mistake, all right, this is an easy mistake to make, and it's one that I just made. It's only on that first one where you want two rings. Every time after this, you grab one and one. Uh, I should have known better there, but, you know, these things happen. It's part of the fun of doing this. And now you can see we're getting a rhythm down really is important because if you just make that mistake and if you didn't catch it you will now have to go back and fix your work and that takes up more time so getting that solid rhythm down is really really important to getting this done efficiently and quickly all right that looks better now you'll notice that i have four closed rings that i've added and three open rings that i've added and that's, uh, that's the way this pattern works, is that it will go, um, you know, an, a given number, and then let's call it given number n, then n minus 1, n, n minus 1, throughout the whole thing. And I know that my n number here, the, which is the nominal number of rings in, a, in the full row, is 60. So I know that I need 60 closed rings and 59 open rings. So in this tray... I, have 50, I had 59 rings, and in the closed tray, I had 60 rings. So for me, I don't like to just open a whole bunch and close a whole bunch and then go at this. Um, I prefer to count mine out so that way I can just do one row at a time, and I don't have any open or closed afterwards that I have to worry about keeping separate from my main batch. 
Uh, it takes a little bit more time to count them out, but um, I think for the speed that I'm just trying to finish this project at, it that works perfectly fine. Now you can do it like this, just grabbing one at a time, putting them together, or well, one of each at a time and putting them together. But this is, I think, a pretty slow way to do it. There is a process improvement that can be made from what I'm doing right now that will help to speed things up. And it's another sort of a, uh, a preparation sort of thing. So this is what I do when I'm trying to get a whole bunch of this stuff done pretty quickly. And you'll notice that these open rings are kind of a pain because they always clump together. So you grab a handful of those and separate them. And then pair each of those up with an open ring. And you can probably see where I'm going with this. You just want to get all of these set up before, beforehand so when you go to actually put them on the sheet, you don't have to keep reaching into these dishes every single time. At the end of the day, you just need to do what's fastest for you. And you really don't need to be in a hurry. I know I've been talking about speed kind of this whole time, but to me, this is, uh, it's kind of therapeutic just to be going at this. You can put some music on in the background. Uh, I don't recommend uh, putting on movies or videos because they tend to be distracting and then you'll do more watching of the video than, um, you know, placing of rings. So now that I have some of these rings already pre-made, I just have to grab one, put it in, and close it. Grab one, put it in, and close it. Now you may be thinking, Casey, that looks pretty easy. I wouldn't make a mistake. Well, that's maybe because you haven't done it yet. Assuming you're watching this and you've never done this before, uh, it is incredibly easy to make a mistake where you miss, you miss a ring or you have an extra ring like I did at the very beginning just because your mind floats away to some, some other place and you're, you're not thinking so. Instead of getting all three of these rings, maybe you only get these two. And you can already see that doesn't make the, that nice flat pattern. So you really got to be, uh, you got to be paying attention. And that right there is the hard part about chain mail. It's not about learning the pattern so much or physically putting this stuff together. It's getting your head game down because if your mind wanders too far away from what you're doing, you're, you're going to make a big mistake. And on this European four and one pattern, it's really easy to see the mistakes and they're easy and fast to fix usually. What's a bummer is when you missed one way up here um, or let's say somewhere in here and then it meant that every single row was behind on one. So you'd have to unzip it here, shift everything over and kind of add one to every row if you, if you did it really wrong, if you really screwed up. But there are other much more complicated patterns um, I'll throw up a few pictures of some right now that you can look at, and they are, oh, they're so difficult to, uh, to get right in your head. I mean, you know, compared to this. That uh, friend I mentioned earlier, he made a whole chainmail vest, 
or I, actually it's not just a vest, it's a shirt. It's a full shirt in the elf pattern, which is one of the most complicated patterns. And he did it with bicolor. So he got some black rings and some stainless rings like this. And it looks so cool. And I got to put it on. It's, it's, it's pretty heavy. And I, I can't even begin to imagine the number of hours that took. I mean, he told me the number of hours it took him. And yeah, that's, it's impressive, the people that can do that. So. I don't know how much of this I'm going to uh, film and how much I'm going to speed through. I might time lapse some of this. But keep in mind, I'm going to be doing 12,000 rings worth of this. I've gotten through maybe an eighth of the bucket here. I can do the math on how many rows I have. Tell you what, I'll do the math after the video and I'll put in the number of how many I'll, I'll have when I finish this row. And that'll give you an idea of how much work goes into this. When I was first starting this um, and I didn't have my process down, it took me about an hour to get one row. And notice that when I say a row, oh, you see, I wasn't paying attention and I messed up. So, um, let's see, I think opening this one will be the fastest way to fix this. And it is seriously that easy to mess up. Sometimes the easiest way is just to go in with all open rings and do it one by one. All right, so you can see here, I'll need a two more open rings there. So I'll take two of my closed rings and turn them into open rings. And I will feed those down. So you see, mistakes are simply that, they're that easy to make. You start thinking about other topics and you'll miss, you'll miss a ring. And now we're back on track. So where was I? Oh yeah. So when I was first starting this project, it took me about an hour to go through, um, each row, and a row is, you really do two rows at once. You do one of your n number rows and one of your n minus one number rows as you go along. So you could consider it this being one pass instead of one row, but I mean, it's, you're, you know, semantics at that point. some more matching here. You know, I am somewhat surprised that this, uh, that chainmail isn't more popular. Even among the, uh, the creator community on YouTube, I, I think Adam Savage is one of the few people who is a, a general creator and not just a chainmail channel, who has uh, discussed chainmail at length. Uh, most other creators, I haven't really seen anything on the topic.
Not quite sure why that is. I guess it's just uh, it's too niche of a of a trade that uh, not only is it underappreciated, but just people don't even know what to appreciate about it. So even people that make videos about it uh, just don't get views because no one's searching for it. And it takes a guy, you know, the size of uh, Adam Savage to really get enough reach in the community to have anybody take notice. So yeah, we're making good progress here. This should only take, I don't know, 30 minutes to do the whole thing. I, I've gotten at least good enough at this now where opening and closing all of my rings and laying out the whole new row only takes uh, about 30 minutes. It's about 15 minutes to open and close all the rings and about 15 minutes to about 15 minutes to lay down the pass. And that's if I'm really, you know, trying to go quickly. That's a rate of about seven seconds per ring opened and closed. And that's about 10 seconds or so. Uh, yeah, about 10 to 12 seconds for doing the pat or 10 to 12 seconds per pair for the whole pass. It gets you about 30 minutes for the row. I just remembered um, Cody's lab. He made the that really cool copper chainmail lab coat. How could I have forgotten that? That's probably the coolest chainmail project I've seen. Um, not because he used a complex pattern, but because he made it out of copper and he brazed the whole thing together. That takes a lot of dedication because, I mean, none of this is, is welded or soldered or brazed. This is just bending the rings together. So this is actually really weak. A genuine chain mail, which can also be just called mail or um, ring mail. There's a lot of different names for it. Uh, originally, it was flat. It was not, it wasn't made of round pieces like, like uh, this stuff today. The reason why the contemporary chain mail is round is because it's the easiest and cheapest way to manufacture the uh, the rings, and additionally, the the genuine rings from the period were not only flat, but they where they overlapped, there was a hole through them, and then they were riveted together, every single ring, and that just makes the whole process take you know easily ten times the amount of time to do a whole, you know, a whole shirt or, or pants or a coif, which is, uh, you know, a hat. It's a fancy word for a hat. You can see I'm a little bit off on my count for the open and closed, and I think that's because I made that mistake earlier. But that's okay. I can just use these as closed later on. Stainless for these rings is probably my favorite simply because it's not dirty. You can see my hands are not filthy or dirty. The only dirt that's on my hands is actually from the players. If you get aluminum, your hands are going to be black every time you touch this stuff uh, because the aluminum uh, braids against itself and... It just, it, it coats everything in a, in just a black film of aluminum dust, really. Again, aluminum, I think, is the more popular material, 
simply because of, of cost and weight. I think uh, the stainless looks the best. I don't see a whole lot of value in getting regular carbon steel because it rusts, so you have to keep it oiled. And unless you're going for something a little bit more authentic, I don't see much value in that. It, it's just going to get your clothes oily and dirty. Stainless, I think, is really the way to go. And I, I specifically went with this size. This is half inch and 14 gauge because I wanted it to be heavy. The part of the reason why I like chainmail is just because of its weight. I like uh, I like dense things, and it's it's very uh, the stuff is very it's very tactile. See, we've been going for about 40 minutes so far. I kind of like longer format videos in terms of what I watch. It's uh, especially things like this where it's just kind of, you know, relaxing to sit and watch and let your brain melt away from the monotony of, of a long day. Most people might not find this sort of thing that uh, that fun, but it's it's definitely uh, a hobby for technical people. I can't imagine people that aren't interested in technical fields would be too interested in something like this. Another reason why I like it is because it really is uh, very, has a very low barrier to entry really I, again this is really easy to start and get into you know there's a little bit of a cost barrier to entry because the rings aren't really they aren't all that cheap but if you can get yourself some rings and just start messing around with this stuff you can do really cool things you know, I just, I completely forgot until now, there's um, something called chainmail inlays, where it's usually with anodized aluminum of all different colors, and sort of like a dot painting, you just use each ring and its color to make shapes and patterns, like um, seals and crests, all the way to uh, almost like paintings. All right, so we come down to the to the end here. And now is if I get to see whether or not my count was correct in the beginning. And then the final one here just goes through the last inner ring, and there we go. There's a whole new row. All 
and that's how you do European four and one. It's a, it's a nice pattern. I think it looks pretty good. Um, I do prefer the European six and one, which is sort of like four and one, but instead of having the four per one ring, you have three on each side looped through and it's a it's a just looks like a finer grain version of this and that's that's my favorite but it takes a lot more rings and a lot more time you can imagine because instead of just going every you know connecting every two you have to connect every three it's a denser pattern but uh, I think it's worth doing in certain areas I'm not doing it for this project because I don't have that sort of time and yeah, that's uh, that's really all there is to it to chain mail. Give it a shot yourself.